So it is time for me to get back to doing something which I have not done in years. And by in years, I mean since before the pandemic. I'm going to record a video about a movie I just saw at a theater and talk about it. Specifically, I just saw Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, in the theater. Well, not the theater, a movie theater. You know what I mean. Not, yeah. There are multiple movie theaters in the... You may be familiar with the concept, though you may be a little rusty with it. Uh, so... Where to begin? Let's talk a bit about banter. Uh, so, one of the things that, that comes up a bunch on, I keep talking about film criticism and that sort of thing recently as of late, is when people talk talking about banter in movies, we get comparisons made to the MCU. And I understand where this comes from, because MCU movies have popularized a particular variety of banter in the sense that they are popularizing a kind of banter that is about, for lack of a better term, wit, but not flawless wit. Now, let me explain. When we started getting into the talkies in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, you had movies that had, the, with screenwriters and directors, sometimes not the same person, which featured rapid fire banter with actors with really strong chemistry. Um, think movies like my fair lady think movies like, um, honestly, like Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall are known for this. Uh, like there is a scene added to the, uh, big sleep based, um, basically just to give Bacall and bogey a big extended, uh, banter scene that wasn't in the original cut of the movie and didn't expand the plot very much. And that was there just to have them bounce dialogue off each other and be witty at each other. And that was the appeal of what part of the thing for the movie is you don't just, what makes a talkie a bigger, grander deal than the silent films were isn't just oh you have more involved in music in the movies you can hear you can hear uh duke ellington you can hear count basie um or all these other jazz musicians performing their music themselves um because certainly you had jazz musicians and their orchestras getting put into movies as part of the appeal for going to go see a talkie but also you had like the banter became part of the selling point. You go to a talkie to see people talk. That's what that's what that's what makes talkies gives them that strength that silent films didn't have. On the other hand, though, like as films went on, as you started getting into the fifties, sixties, and seventies, you started to like, get a push towards what was considered quote unquote naturalistic dialogue, and some of this is with the rise of the of the method. Um, or method acting. Some of it is related to when you started getting um, bigger and wider aspect ratios of film. Uh, you, the desire to, okay, we're putting this big picture on the screen, and that's the selling point now. Uh, you can have the rapid fire banter on the talk box on your television at home or on the radio. Not even the radio, but on the television at home. You could have that there, but you couldn't have the big sweeping visuals um, or this particular type of spectacle, spectacular action scenes. And yes, with that also, so with also because that the focus became less on having a bunch of super witty people being witty at each other, being a selling point, you, the banter mellowed. You still have actors who are cast because they are talented at being witty or menacing or that sort of thing, or menacing while being witty. Um, I mean, this is a certain degree, a chunk of Jack Nicholson's career is that. But then you move on again. Uh, what happens is actually this thing start to change with T 
TV writers and directors starting to move towards film, or somewhat vice versa. And what I think helps make that shift is Buffy and the Buffy writers room, not just Joss Whedon, but James Jane Spencer and others. It is not it's important to mention that Joss isn't the only person in that writer's room writing for that show. Uh, and also with that would hit struck me as well, as we're getting to the nineties here, by the way, is Farscape. Because Farscape also, like both these shows have a they start bringing banter back, but they bring a different variety of banter. In like the Thin Man, in in the Big Sleep, and all of that, everyone like these characters aren't just witty; they are good at being witty. Again, take that phone conversation in in the in the Big Sleep. At no point does Lauren Bacall stumble, and there's no point to come across that, oh, she's being thrown off when uh, Humphrey Bogart's character says, um, like, I didn't call you, you called me. Let me get Mother on the phone. And then hands it back to Lauren McCall, who called them in the first place. At no point does that, like, at no point does that, um, does Lauren Bacall's character, or Lauren Bacall as an actress, come across as when they, when she pick, picks the phone and plays along, does she come across as stumbling or improvising and that sort of thing. What Farscape, what uh, Buffy and Angel brought to the table is the idea of characters who not just have natural, not trying to do a naturalistic dialogue, but a naturalistic dialogue where characters try to be witty, but it doesn't always land. And in some cases they know it all, it lands like a big part of on Buffy Xander's dialogue and even like the, the interplay of Xander and Willow is they is not just is they try to be witty. They try to make clever quips and that sort of thing. And like particularly, for example, for Xander, he not only does Xander not always succeed, Xander frequently doesn't succeed. Um but it's not the joke isn't that Xander is stupid for trying. The joke is like, you know, that's is it's more naturalistic for a character to attempt to make a witty remark and not quite stick the landing. Um, and with also happening with Buffy, with um, Angel, and like, everyone else have these moments. But like, and what made this work for me, and what made it resonate for me as a viewer, is as time was coming to these shows again, particularly for this matter, Farscape. I came to them having been all at this point well been. In introduced for quite some time to tabletop role-playing games. And that's where the tie-in with Dungeons & Dragons and what MCU dialogue is, is. The MCU dialogue doesn't just feel like people trying to be witty and occasionally not landing it. It feels like the way you talk when you're around a role-playing game table and you're playing your character. You are being... Your wit is for an audience not of a uh, hundred people in a movie theater or in a theater theater. It's for an audience of, of seven of five to seven people, a uh, game master plus four to six players. And so you're in this tight group of people and bouncing stuff off each other, the players bouncing off each other and the game master, the game master playing the non-player characters and, improvising their dialogue and bouncing off the characters and that sort of thing. And so this level of not flawless wit, but unpolished wit works incredibly well, like ultimately for the Dungeons and Dragons movie, because that in a degree, to a significant extent, hits the core val hits the core of the Dungeons and Dragon experience, just as much as fantasy high adventure and combat and casting spells and that sort of thing. Is the core of the Dungeons and Dragon experience is you and your friends together playing a game and making jokes, and sometimes they're 
breaking the fourth wall, real life references, but they, which they don't do in this movie, thankfully. Uh, but gives this sense of uh, oh, that you're, uh, you're bouncing your jokes off your friends, and you know, and your friends know that you're not as witty as you actually as you're not flawlessly witty. You will misstep. You will slip up. It's going to happen. And you and your friends are okay with that, and you roll with it. No pun intended, because rolling dice in D&D. And that... So getting off the bat, before getting any spoiler stuff, plot synopses, anything, I think was what makes this Dungeons & Dragons movie, much more so than the ones that came before, feel true to Dungeons and Dragons. Not every, no one, like people can be clever and witty, but they're never really as clever and witty as you, as they think they are. And it helps this film has a cast that does that very well. That we have, for example, like Justice Smith, I've seen him previously in uh, Detective Pikachu and he has a he does a similar job there of he has a character who has a blank characters who have self confidence issues but not ones that get in their way get in the way of them doing what needs to be done and doing the right thing. Um, now there is a degree with Justice Smith with um, Simon Justice Smith's character where. It takes him a while in the story to overcome his self-confidence issue. That is, that's his big character arc, but it works here. Um, it also works for that, as Jeannie said, to like, plans don't go in D&D. Not only don't they go off, do they not go off without a hitch? They regularly go off, they regularly have a lot of hitches. Um, some cases, the hitches are, lead to them having to redo the plan. Sometimes it even involves going back to the same, to the previous plan. Um, some of this is because Dungeons and Dragons, because again, around the D&D cable, we are not as clever as we think we are. We come up with these big, clever, cunning plans, which often the game master thinks, oh, the player's going to go this way, and the plan goes off whee, over here, because players are the craziest people. Um, and that, again, fits fairly well here. Uh, Chris Pine is excellent. I absolutely buy him playing a bard, both in the sense of him like having a similar um, charm in the Star Trek movies, but also I saw the End of the Woods live action um, film version, not the uh, live staging that was on PBS, but the film version where he played once of the Prince of the Princess Charming. So I know that Chris Pine can be an immensely charming person. I also know that Chris Pine can sing f very well. He is underestimated in his vocal ability. I'm not saying he should cut a return to Br return of Bruno esque album, but I am saying, look, if he decides to tag a short break and do Broadway and, and do a musical, I think he could pull it off. So there's that Michelle Rodriguez. Michelle Rodriguez, her performance in this film is her best performance to date. Like there's a bit when she was interviewed, she was guest for not my job on wait, wait, don't tell me. And she kind of casually says, says when describing her role as Letty in the fast franchise is her role is driving cars, beating up some people and then yelling for Dom. Or, or, or worrying about Dom. And she does so much more in this. She is much more of a character. Um, pull something up real quick. Make sure we have the name correct. Um, Holga. Olga 
in this movie is excellent. Um, and Sarah Jacobs is a great shot with this, where she is playing very much. She's not playing the total straight person. Um, there is a uh, even more uh, straight character uh, compared to Holga um, Zank. But she plays an excellent comedic foil, not the sense of um, being, uh, not in the way that Drax is a comedic foil to the Guardians, but more in the sense of the way she balances off her cast for the, the banter, with the cast for the banter is wonderfully done. And with all of this also comes, um, like she has got some great fight scenes and she is a much, in a much stronger role than again, a lot of the previous roles. Like she, it feels like she has more stuff to sink her teeth into in a way that I never really got the vibe that uh, Letty really got in the in the Fast series. As far as um, the plot in the movie goes, like if you case the honor among thieves, part of the title to figure out didn't clue you in. This is a heist movie. It is a um, very well done heist movie and does a very interesting job of having of doing these heist concepts in a fantasy context does this in a way which also does a great job of fitting in some of the other stuff you do expect to get from Dungeons and Dragons that the general audience doesn't expect. They expect you to go on, have an important magical MacGuffin that you need to complete the job because that's what fantasy requires. Um, they expect dragons to be in here because it's Dungeons and Dragons. You need to have dungeons, you need to have dragons. Good news, there are both. And... On top of all of this, uh, we have, but but on top of all this, we have a really good integration of concepts of Dungeons and Dragons of the game, and in this case, the setting of Faerun. Um, honestly, one of the one of the great weaknesses, one of the many great weaknesses of the two thousands and Dragon movie. There's a lot of problems there. Some of them are small, a lot of them are big, but one of the big ones is they didn't go, you know, we should attach this to an existing setting that the fans have attachment to, and also which people have done a whole bunch of work developing already that will save us a bunch of time when it comes to developing it. And we're going to put this in the realms. We have made for fifth edition the realms, Forgotten Realms and Faerun, effectively the default setting. And we're just going to put it there. And on the one hand, there's probably a fair number of people who are sick and tired of the realms. On the other hand, though, it makes things really simple to go. Like It feels, and it flows well to have, hey, we're going to go to the city of Neverwinter. And we're going to have the a lot of the plot focus around there because Neverwinter can't catch a break. Um, Waterdeep has problems too, but Neverwinter really can't catch. Uh, also, Baldur, uh, Neverwinter and Baldur, um, Neverwinter, Baldur's Gate, and um, and probably also Waterdeep of the major cities that we've gotten realms are the ones that um, never really catch a break. But never winter, thanks to the MMO in particular, really isn't helped. Um, but we go to never winter. But the plot is well is very character driven. It's like the characters are stealing stuff, but they are stealing stuff. Like there, there is a save the world plot that comes up into this, but the initial focusing of the plot is character motive is all built on the characters' motivations. Um, that Edgen wants to do right by his daughter and um, get a MacGuffin that could bring back his late wife. And so that 
that his daughter could know her mom, her um, birth mom. And that pushes the story forward. And in a way that so many of the other films, which are just the bad guy wants this MacGuffin to destroy the world and the characters have to stop them. Um, it, which is, you know, it's the plot of those 3 d movies. It's the plot of the Death Stalker movies. It's almost the plot of the Conan movies. It is f- swords and sorcery fantasy movie plot number one. And I appreciate the fact that Dungeon Dragon movie goes, no, we are not. This is the Dungeons and Dragons movie. This is not Death Stalker 7. So we're not going to write this taking um, Owen, taking uh, Owen Deathstalker, scrapping, scratching that out. Yes, Owen is Deathstalker's first name and putting in Edgin and instead of the, the, the generic swordswoman character called Hol, scratch out Holga, we're not doing that. And all of this works really well. I like that with the special effects budget we have now that we're able to, in a lot of respects, really realize Dungeons and Dragons spells on screen incredibly well and have them look good, but also the film uses a good job with a lot of really great practical effects. If you've seen the uh, Speak With Dead sequence on YouTube, you can tell that a lot of this is practical effects, and and it really gives this film a sense of weight. It's also clear that as much as studio executives go, oh, CGI effects are cheap. Uh, you said that the directors and writers behind this, like, yeah, visual effects are de- are are cheap, but I like physical effects. I like practical effects because practical effects are fun to work with and cool to look at on screen and gives the actors something tangible to do. Honestly, like, for all the crap that the volume gets, the reason the volume ultimately exists is it's an actor... John Favreau going, what if instead of reacting to a X painted or taped on a blue screen um, or a ping pong ball on a stick, I have something I can actually look at. And that's, and so, so yeah, lots of really good practical effects here. Writing is excellent. I appreciate them inc- incorporating stuff like, you know, tieflings into um, the film and additional breadth of setting there. The villain's plan is, like, worked well. Um, worked well for me. And, like, I I had a really great time. This class cast is excellent chemistry. And the nice thing about Dungeons & Dragons and Forgotten Realms as a setting is... I'd like to think that in the event we like, if this does want to get a sequel or a television series or that sort of thing, I would like to hope that the audience un- does enough buy-in at this being a larger setting and that this work did enough filmed enough heavy lifting in terms of through dialogue and other similar stuff getting across. You know, this is a, a big setting. Varun's a big continent that for future works. That if that you, it's not dependent on Chris Pine and Justice Smith and Michelle Rodriguez and this cast to carry the existence of of um, all the subsequent films or television series or spinoffs or whatever. In a way, in, in particular, in a way that like. Way that the MCU, not to go back there now, has run into a bit of weirdness with how do uh, of finding the footing of the MCU without Robert Downey Jr. Uh, without um, being reliant on either Chris Hemsworth or Chris Pratt or. Basically, without Thor, Iron, well, the original core Avengers, without being dependent on having to have them around all the time to carry the subsequent movies and building up new characters for a subsequent Avengers cast and having the audience buy into that. That 
this film that this film will hopefully do a decent enough job that at getting the size of the world across well enough that for a streaming series or sequel films or all of the above that you can go, Oh, Hey, this is about a different adventuring party in water deep or a different adventuring party in, um, um, on the moon sea or what have you that people will go, okay, I get it now. And I'm not reliant or dependent on like having those characters and you can, I, I will go where you will take me. Cause that also in turn will allow for opportunities for exploring entirely different settings than just forgotten realms that to go to Eberron to go to um, I forget, to, I forget the name of the planet from um, Dark Sun, but doing something like Dark Sun or Greyhawk or Dragonlance or even like just shifting genres completely and going to like Greyhawk, going to like um, Ravenloft and that and that heroic fantasy meets gothic horror type campaign. Uh, having that room to breathe would be wonderful. I mean, in, and I'd like to see again where they go from there. It sounds like the movie did reasonably well at the box office. It's didn't necessarily have super long legs, but it's or have has has not necessarily had super long legs. Um, it's like it's been beaten out the box office by Mario as of this week. I'm recording that is the week of the weekend of the fifteenth. Um, but it has a strong showing compared to John Wick. And at least it's something like it might stick around for a while, even if it doesn't stay on top. So we'll see how things go. Have you seen the movie? If so, so what do you think? Let me know in the thread, in the comments below. And what tabletop role playing game outside of Dungeons and Dragons would you like to see adapted to the big screen next? Do you want us to go to lunch, take a trip to Night City for a cyberpunk film? Um, Shadowrun, um, Vampire the Masquerade, or heck, let even do a super film in a setting that's not attached to the big two comics or like an existing comics thing, like um, the Champions or what have you. Let me know in the comments. I'm interested to see what your thoughts are. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 